Make your choice. The large man said, saliva leaking down his ski mask from his watering mouth. The three who were with him didn't say much, as he trained the barrel of his gun between my wife and eight-year-old daughter, but the expression etched into their eyes was not the same as his. Neither my begging nor Sarah and Lindsay's tears made any difference in that exhilarated hunger behind the large man's gaze. If anything, it only filled him with more excitement. Me! I shouted. Just kill me. If you want blood, take... His boot made short work of my bargaining, leaving my head spinning in the process. Choose one, or I'll choose for you. He said in a disturbingly calm voice. My mind couldn't accept what was happening, threatening to shudder under the weight of it, being pulled from our sleep and dragged into the living room with our hands bound before being able to take in what was happening had left me in a certain degree of shock as it was. But I couldn't fathom what they even wanted. All four of the men were dressed in black from head to toe, with thick woolen masks covering their faces and padded jackets. They were all armed, two with shotguns, one with some sort of assault rifle, and the one directly threatening us with seemingly only the pistol he delighted in switching between my wife and daughter. They didn't appear to be interested in robbing us, only in forcing me to pick a sacrifice, something I was not willing to do. While the associates of the drooling individual with the wide and maniacal eyes did not seem as excited about this as he, they weren't exactly putting a stop to it either. Please, I begged, my voice cracking from my splitting heart. If you have to kill anyone, just... That wouldn't exactly get the message across now, would it? The man said, as though this was an undeniable fact. What message? I've never... Again, his heavy boot met my jaw silencing my words quickly. Now, Mr. Pregg, he said, cocking his gun to assure me that he was serious. You're going to do what you're told, or I'm going to plug them both, you hear me? What? I asked, my spinning head attempting to grasp what he was saying. Pregg? My name is Baker, Terrence Baker, who is... Um, Rick? The shorter of the three behind the larger man said, glancing at the phone he held. We, um, might, uh, really, Larry? You're gonna drop names over here? He said, seemingly uninterested in what the apparent Larry had to say. Ah, oh, shit. The guy next to Larry said, looking at the screen his buddy held. You gotta see this, um, you gotta see this. Don't you move a damn muscle. He said to me before turning back to his little posse. They muttered back and forth in words I couldn't make out. That was until the big guy lost what little cool he had. What the fuck? He said, snatching the one with the phone by the collar, his words dropping out of earshot again. We gotta get the hell out of- Really? Oh, just leave. Pretend it never happened after you drop my damn name. What are you, simple? We can't just- We have to. No, I won't do this. I won't be a part of this shit. You'll be a part of what I tell you to be a part of. They bantered back and forth like this for minutes on end, while I struggled to break my wrist loose from the zip ties. Sarah was trying to do the same, slowly shifting closer to me, likely to see if we could at least get one of us loose. Lindsay was almost hysterical, making me want nothing more than to wrap my arms around her and tell her everything was going to be alright, even if I didn't believe a word of it myself. When the debating quartet stopped talking, the large man turned to face us. We just froze, terrified. We were about to be punished for being caught trying to get free. While that wasn't entirely the case, the truth of things would be far worse. Got some good news and bad, buddy boy. He said with a heavy sigh, his eyes looking far less demented, perhaps even a bit saddened. Good news, you don't gotta choose after all. My pulse raced even faster than before as I knew exactly where this was headed. Bad news, well... You heard some shit you shouldn't have, so... We won't say anything, Sarah said, gasping for breath. Just let us... Neither the sharp pain breaching my chest nor my daughter shrieking out fully registered above the gunshot echoing through the room. The wide-eyed and shocked expression froze on my beautiful wife's face as the bullet tore through her skull, leaving my mind unable to form a rational thought. Somewhere outside of my muted senses, I saw the aim of the barrel shift from where it lingered to face my whimpering child. 
As she cried out harder than she ever had before, my legs took over for my vacant mind firing me across the room like a well-aimed bullet. Another gunshot echoed right as my shivering body landed in front of my baby girl, with a blinding and swiftly dissipating agony tearing through my very being. I could only make out the distant and muffled sounds as my consciousness faded into the black. More gunshots and screams that seemed miles away to my fractured senses, but all fell silent and still soon after. It can't end like this, a voice spoke from within the darkness. You gonna just lay there and let go? Who are you? The voice sounded both familiar and foreign at the same time. I felt like I could seek comfort in it, while part of whatever I was now begged me to run from it. It isn't about me, it said. But you, will you allow them to win? To steal so much from you and carry on? I can't, I mean, what the hell can I do? Everything, Terry. Everything and anything, if you want. No, I just want to get back to them. To Sarah and Lynn. I can't. Live or die, make your choice, buddy boy. Don't say that. You gotta pick one, kiddo. What's it gonna be? Stop that. It's that simple, but you don't even have to say it out loud. But you gotta pick. What the hell do you want from me? Something that'll help us both. A mutually beneficial transaction, so to speak. But you gotta let me in. The voice continued to speak, saying words I would forget soon after. I recall a conviction building up within me that I'd never known. A determination more potent than even my desire to reach wherever those I love now found themselves. All I can remember after that was... Wake up. My mind and body may as well have been on separate continents when my eyes slowly drifted back to awareness. Everything around me was blurry, my pupils reluctant to focus on the bright lights surrounding where I lay. As the ambient beeping sounds reached my clouded ears, my brain hobbling far behind, desperately trying to keep up, I finally understood. Nurses and doctors alike came in and out of my room over the following hours while my distant mind still fought to catch up. Over the coming days, I was informed about the coma I had been in for the better part of seven months, along with the nature of my injuries. The scarring that covered most of my right side, my arm, leg, chest, back, and face had been caused by the fire. It would seem that the men who attacked my family attempted to cover up the evidence of their mistakes by leaving it in ash. If nothing else, my comatose state had allowed me to avoid a good deal of agonizing recovery from the severe burns over 40% of my body. Given the circumstances though, they had not attempted any reconstructive surgery. Of course, the last thing I cared about at the time was being a good deal less pleasing to the eye, as my wife and daughter had not been as fortunate as I. According to the detective in charge of the case, who showed up some days after my reawakening, Sarah was beyond saving and there was very little left of Lindsay. While all of this threatened to send my fractured heart and mind back into and beyond my only recently escaped coma, there was still more unsettling news to come. The nature of the damage to my brain. The bullet tore through the side of my forehead, almost obliterating the bone in that area before blowing through the other side, sending fragments and shrapnel ricocheting through my head. Most of the damage I suffered was to the ventrolateral frontal cortex, which apparently controls some cognitive function, language, and the like. While the doctor was surprised that I was not only able to speak, but to understand speech, he informed me that I would likely have to relearn how to fully function again. There was also some damage to the primary somatosensory cortex, secondary somatosensory cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, prefrontal cortex, and amygdala. This all sounded like Greek to me, even if my brain wasn't somewhat made of Swiss cheese now, I would think. The only positive side of this was that I would likely feel far less pain from here on out, with the receptors being out of commission. He didn't see it that way, of course, as pain is important to diagnosing problems and such, but with how much agony my heart and broken mind were experiencing, less physical distress sounded like something of a reprieve to me. Yes, I had a long way to go, as well as a very unpredictable quality of life in my future but none of that compared to how much I longed to be with my wife and daughter again. Over the seemingly endless months that followed, 
I would, as the doctor predicted, have to train my body to obey my will again. It wasn't easy and felt like it would never end, but every step I took filled me with purpose. Between my physical and mental therapy, various surgeries were performed on my scarred flesh. Apparently, these operations would normally come with some less than pleasant recuperation, but given my recent lack of pain receptors, I continued to power through my relearning to function. In many ways, I found my limited physical sensation to be the only gift to come from this ordeal, though I did unknowingly break my right pinky from a fall at one point. The therapist didn't find it as funny as I did. At the time, my finger angled in the wrong direction after he helped me back to my feet, but it would become a running joke to us after that. Jeremy Pickman, a mid-twenties, well-built African-American kid with intricate tattoos lining his muscled arms, would grow to become a very close friend over that time. He pushed me when I had no push left and allowed me to break when my heart screamed out from the agony of my loss. I can't even say how many days I fell to the floor in tears, crumbling under the weight of everything. Jeremy wouldn't speak or attempt to talk me down. He would just sit beside me, wrap an arm around me, and let me cry. Sometimes he would even join me in that. While he was in charge of quite literally getting me back on my feet again, he fully understood that the damages to my soul was not so easily mended. For such a young man, he had wisdom beyond his years. I can most definitely say that I would not have made it through that time without him. When I was finally ready to rejoin the land of the living, I was actually in the best shape of my life. The best physical shape, anyway. My scars were not quite as bad as they were when I awoke, but they were still quite noticeable. The surgeons did an incredible job, all things considered, but I would still get some uneasy glances from passersby on the street. My ravaged brain seemed to be operating far better than anyone expected, but I would still slip on certain words or have to search a little harder for memories here and there. I wouldn't be able to return to my job as much of what I learned in college was quite muddled or lost to the shrapnel, carving through my skull. I was an architect before all of this, a job that I was not only exceptional at, but very much adored. Between the insurance on the house, as well as the life insurance on my wife and daughter, I wouldn't have any reasons to stress financially for some time, even with the ungodly medical bills, but none of that really mattered to me. I moved into a decently sized loft apartment in the city after my 18 months of recovery. I say moved, but I didn't actually own much of anything anymore, as the fire had consumed my belongings, just as it had my family. Though I didn't need much, being an unemployed widower, I would need to at least gather some necessities for the work ahead. The first thing I invested in was some chalkboard paint for at least one of the good-sized walls in my loft. Along with a far more limited sense of touch, I was enduring some focusing issues. My doctor felt certain this would pass, as my brain would likely still be repairing what it could for some time, but I didn't have time to wait for my head to get right. Though I hadn't figured out how to go about it, the only way I could endure life without my wife and precious daughter was to throw everything I had into bringing justice to those who took them from me. They had left no evidence behind, nor given much in the way of clues, from what I could remember anyway. All I knew was that we were not their intended targets. That much I figured out before they attempted to cover their tracks by silencing us. These thoughts were the first to christen my newly painted wall, along with just about anything else I could recall about them. The large man was the only one who talked, but his voice was very distinctive. Whether it was just a part of the persona he would use for such events, or if that hunger in his eyes was real, I couldn't know. Still, he reminded me of some old-school, shit-talking wrestler with the enthusiastic and menacing growl to his tone. To keep track of that thought, he would be labeled Macho Man on the wall. With Rick in parentheses, his associates, or lackeys, I had little to nothing to go on. They were all small compared to the apparent ringleader, but they were still bigger than average. Before my arduous physical therapy, I would look like a meth head next to any of them, but I was sure I could hold my own now if it came to a fight. For my family and I to have been an accidental hit, we would have to have some common ground with those they were seeking. My old address, 17 Marigold Drive, was similar enough to several other neighborhoods around the town I lived in. While it could have very well been another house on the same street, Maybe they simply had the wrong number. Given the expensive looking padded, likely armored coats they wore, plus their ability to remain silent until snatching us from our sleep, they were likely highly trained and highly paid. 
With that in mind, they, or those who hired them, would have surely done their research. They would at least be familiar with the certain aspects of their targets, so I had to believe that they were looking for a man with a wife and a young daughter. I'm a fairly average looking guy. Well, I was before the fire left me with more of a unique appearance. But physically, I could have easily fit the bill of any random guy around my age, give or take hair color and the like back then. The movies always show assassins being given pictures of their marks, but even if they had that much, being certain they were in the right place would likely save them from questioning any subtle differences. My name and my face wouldn't matter much if they knew they were in the right place. The name they called me, Mr. Preg, wasn't the most common, but something kept telling me that I shouldn't waste time digging myself into that rabbit hole. No, a similar address and a similar household, that was where I would begin. As I stepped back to stare at the information I'd scribbled across my wall, my eyes almost lost focus for a moment. Not only was just about every word a different size and shape, but they overlapped one another, some going up or diagonal, others side to side or even backward. While I assumed it was simply my muddled brain still attempting to get writing down again, I was still able to read everything I'd laid out. After a moment, it was as my eyes traced the distorted text that I noticed several words and sentences I did not recall writing. Though words like kill and burn were not surprising, given everything that still haunts me, things like stop fighting and let me in were a bit more puzzling. Those were confusing enough, but it was a sentence etched into the board in an almost unsettlingly foreign text that left my head spinning. I can help you find them. As I stared at these words, I became aware of a strange itching inside my head. The doctor had told me that I would likely experience chronic headaches for some time, or would if I had the ability to acknowledge the pain. While this sensation felt more like something moving inside my skull, I reasoned that it was likely a severe migraine that I couldn't fully register. It made sense that a ticking or vibrating would be all my Swiss cheese could make out. If nothing else, that odd feeling distracted me from my stare down with my erratic scribbles. The doc had prescribed some pills just in case I didn't begin to feel anything like pain. I hadn't filled them as I had felt very little over the past year and a half, but this seemed as good a time as any to get out of my apartment for a time. I chose to walk to the pharmacy as not only was driving on the busy city roads a headache in itself, but I hadn't driven since I awoke in that hospital bed. I'd retrain my body as much as I could, but that was something I wasn't quite comfortable enough with yet. Not surrounded by an abundance of traffic, anyway. While the mid-autumn weather wasn't particularly bitter, I kept the collar high on my coat and my hat tilted low, just to avoid the inherent stares my scarred face would earn as I strolled along. With my head in the clouds, I almost didn't notice that sensation of being watched, but when it struck me, I was unprepared for the source. With the slowly puttering traffic to my left and various storefront windows to my right, I assumed it to be something behind me that unsettled me. I turned back to see nothing more than many wandering pedestrians going about their own day. But as I looked back to the path ahead, my periphery locked on the one who glanced back. I tried to brush aside the strangely foreign expression on my reflection in the window of the pleasant little bakery, assuring myself that I was just seeing things. When that feeling grew stronger and stronger, with every peek I took at the various shop windows, that itching in my head gave away to something more like claws digging into my brain. I ran. I refused to look to my side again, just focusing on my sprinting legs, weaving around those with whom I shared the sidewalk. Calm down, Terry. A distant voice murmured from within. Whether it was my own inner monologue attempting to ease my rapid pulse, or the voice belonging to whatever stared back at me through my distorted reflection, I had no idea. Whatever the case, I wouldn't listen. I just ran until my legs shuddered and my lungs begged me to stop. I stopped in place for a time, resting on a bench near the park, as my sprinting had led me far beyond my chosen destination. After a while, I backtracked to the pharmacy I had left in the dust while attempting to keep my scattered mind focused on the task at hand. As soon as I crossed the threshold to my apartment, I pulled open the lid of the pill bottle, knocked back a couple of my meds, and fetched a beer from my fridge to wash them down. I whipped my curtains closed as even my subtle reflection against the skyline seemed to be studying me. I flipped on the television, cranking the volume as loud as I could without a neighbor pounding on my door, and continued to attempt to distract my thoughts. Though the medication did ease the scratching in my skull, it didn't numb it completely. 
Still, a few more beers in, and I managed to brush away the faint whispering that accompanied the itch. When I passed out on my recently purchased comfortable chair is not nearly as relevant as how I found myself when I awoke. Not only was I standing directly in front of my sketchbook wall, but when the chalk slipped from my fingers, I noticed that a good deal more text had been added to my scribblings. Don't ignore me, we can help each other, and vengeance can be yours, were only a few of the sentences I could make out from the zigzagged and barely legible writing. Every word looked as though it was written by trembling fingers, most overlapped or crisscrossed across themselves or other notes I had left. Though I had only recently relearned how to write again, my handwriting varying a good deal from my previous self, this style was not even close to either version of mine. Given the fact that I had seemingly sleepwalked to this spot before I sleep wrote, if that's even a thing, it was the words themselves more than the style that had me reeling. The clawing inside my head was far more aggressive than it had been on the street, as were the muddled whispers, while my pulse echoed through my ears, muffling the faint voice even more. I knew I couldn't continue to ignore it. As I reached for the bottle of little yellow pills, my hand froze, outstretched. I walked to the bathroom, the buttons of my shirt vibrating from my thundering chest. I gazed into the mirror, refusing to flip the light switch on until my eyes focused on my own gaze. When the fluorescent bulbs above my head flickered to life, the expression my reflection wore was not the same as the one on my face. The smile didn't even look like my own. Even with the right side more upturned from the tighter flesh of my scars, the whispering escalated, but still not to the point I could make out a word as the man in the mirror shook his head, gesturing to his lips. With a tilt of the head toward the open door that would lead back to my wide living room, I understood what it wanted. The itching was more aggravated as I wandered back to the chalkboard wall, my mind floating somewhere above me. I just stared at the already crisscrossed scribbled words, feeling my fingers reach for the chalk. Somewhere in the distance, far away from my immediate realm of understanding, the voice still called out to me. For a moment I allowed myself to believe it was nothing more than a neighbor or conversations taking place in the street far below my loft. As the faint words aligned themselves with those my slightly numb fingers lined across the wall, those rationalizations became harder to reach. I-C-A-H-L-P-Y-U I can help you. The first read. My mind was wrestling to maintain control of my hand, pulling the chalk pinched between my fingers, refusing to permit them to remain hostage to whatever this was. S T P I G H T N G Me. Stop fighting me. No. I whispered, my body shuddering violently as the claws dug into my senses. Let M. H E P Y O. Let me help you. No! I cried out, my trembling knees threatening to drop me to the floor. Leave me alone! Can't. What the hell are you? Friend. Whether it was my weakening will or my growing desire to seek out the truth of things, the fingers move with more purpose than I had previously allowed them. How? I said, my chaotic mind betraying my ability to reason. How can you help me? I let my battle to regain control of my borrowed limb slip, permitting the puppeteer to do as it wished with it. I still wouldn't fully accept that anything more than my broken body and mind was at play here, but I suppose I felt I had nothing left to lose. When the single word reply to my question etched into the wall before my eyes, I almost felt my mouth water with possibilities. Revenge. I just glared at the letters my own fingers had lined, the fear of my waning sanity beginning to caress my thoughts. Was this the product of my inability to accept the loss of my wife and daughter, or what it appeared to be, that something else was attempting to help me? I'm losing it. I said to myself, my eyes not blinking from the foreign text my fingers had written. This can't be real, I won't. My spoken thoughts were interrupted by my hand once more acting of its own accord, scribbling more letters on the wall. 17 Marigold Lane Again, I stood, stunned by the information presented to me. Marigold Lane I whispered, my eyes watering from their refusal to blink. Not Marigold Drive 
The jigsaw pieces scattered throughout my Swiss cheese brain shoveled across the surface, scrambling themselves together into a picture that made so much sense. It was the wrong house. I said softly. Before I knew it, I was sitting at my desk, my fingers striking the keys so quickly that I had to delete and retype them a few times to get them right. The thumping in my ears mimicked the pounding in my chest as the results of my search presented me with a variety of grim headlines. Murder in Suburbia, the first read. A Family in Ruin was the title of another article, but Vincent Eugene Prague admits to lying about his testimony after the brutal murder of his wife was the one that caught my eye. Ezekiel Thawne, a reclusive business owner suspected of everything from money laundering to human trafficking. Prague, an accountant for the rich and shameless, according to the article, had various dealings with the man and several of his associates. The article did not list how he had aided these people only that he and his family had been relocated to the home in which his wife was murdered as part of the witness protection program. According to speculation, there must have been some sort of leak, perhaps a mole in whatever agency took care of situating the Prags. I sat, staring at the screen, the words fading to a blur before my eyes. As my mind fought to wrap around the facts, whoever this Thawn was, he was the one responsible for what happened the night I lost everything. While it was his moronic hired help that made the grave mistake before apparently getting the job done as intended, they were the metaphorical guns in the killer's hand. I lost it. The truth behind the events that ripped my life apart crashed into the surface of my brain like a drunken driver to a brick wall. I screamed out, my face tingling as the blood rushed to the flesh, flipping my desk and kicking the computer monitor before it hit the floor. I stopped my keyboard, crunching the plastic keys beneath my heel. I was aware of neither the jagged splits tearing into my socked feet nor the toes I very likely broke on my initial assault against my monitor. My rage-filled fit would not cease as I beat my fists upon my desk, splintering the wood with my blows. My entire body shook from the sheer physical strain of my attack on my belongings, finally dropping me to my knees, gasping for breath. I slowly grew aware of the pulsing in my feet and hands. Even if I couldn't feel the pain, my legs and arms were still trembling from my tantrum. The pounding on the floor, likely from my downstairs neighbor's broomstick, may have almost made me laugh at myself if I wasn't so exhausted at the time. Sorry. I called out, struggling against my weakened extremities as I got to my feet. The thumping against the ceiling beneath me dissipated as I limped to the bathroom, mentally beating myself up for, well, beating myself up. As I held my shivering hands beneath the cold water, my eyes met the stranger in the mirror again, this time with no apprehension but the desire to accept his help. Let me in, he mouthed, the distant echoing voice speaking the words from afar. How? I asked, ignoring the blood pooling in the sink. His lips formed words I couldn't make out, the voice too far off to make out. He didn't have to gesture to the wall this time. I hobbled back to the scribbled words trailing crimson across the hardwood floor. As I consciously reached for the chalk, my puffy, swollen fingers could not tighten around it. I swore under my breath, fearing that I had inadvertently cut off my only line of communication with wherever this was. When I glanced back up to see my reddened hand already etching words into the wall, I allowed a smile to reach across my lips. Invite me, I wrote. How? Say my name. Tell me. I can't. Why not? Rules. I cursed aloud. How could I invite whatever this was in if I didn't know its name? As the situation began to cause the heat to brush the skin on my face again, I felt my fingers reach to the wall again. You know it. I don't... How can... dig deeper. We met in the other place. I stepped back, trailing my eyes across the jumbled text scribbled across my wall. I could feel my Swiss cheese digging around, pulling up ancient stones and lifting the corners of the carpet. Flashes of the time I spent distant from my mortal shell revealed only glimpses of what I saw there, the distant echoes of conversations reaching their tendrils to my ears. You were lost too. Yes. The distant voice grew closer, stripped to almost nothing. Yes, you helped me find my way back. You can help me too. I will. 
say it. It was right there. I could almost touch it. The voice drew closer. Why not this? I could feel a herd of cats tearing into my brain, the scratching reaching a vertebral stampede of claws. Say it. I invite you in. The rips began to form a hole, widening slowly to reveal a blurry image. I battled to dial the focus lens in my mind, reaching out to spin it with every fiber of will my body and mind could muster. The darkness behind the veil blinked, softly at first but flickering quicker and quicker. A gentle breeze tossed the curtain, allowing the fog to clear. Just enough, too. Malthus. A sudden and near-blinding light erupted from all around me, causing my skin to momentarily feel as though it was burning. Given the fact that I had not felt even the slightest sensation of pain in many months, even just a hint of this was agonizing. I fell to my knees, my scream blending with the one from deep within my Swiss cheese. My loft shuddered violently, or so it felt to my trembling goose flesh. I couldn't even hope to tell which was which at the time. The claws, which had once been little more than an annoying scratching in my head, now felt as though they were digging into the tissue, peeling it apart like a moth breaching its cocoon. Time bled into an incomprehensible blur as every fiber of my mortal shell felt as though cracks and tears were forming across it. As the light grew brighter and brighter, my eyes burning even more than my flesh, the shock of this agonizing sensation replaced all that I knew. When the vibrant illumination turned to darkness before me, I honestly believed I was dead rather than passed out on the hardwood floor. When I came back to awareness, I was momentarily confused for a moment. I was sitting in my chair, a beer in my hand, and the bathroom mirror propped on a chair in front of me. There was still little flakes of drywall on the sides, seemingly left in the wake of it being yanked from the wall, but that wasn't nearly as disconcerting as the face of my reflection. Thought this make it easier. My image in the mirror said, chugging down a healthy amount of beer that was not unwelcome at the time. Damn, I've missed this. What are you? I asked, noticing that my left eye was no longer the light blue I was used to, but an almost glowing orange. Still working that out myself. It's foggy, you know? I found it strange that his voice differed a good deal from mine. Yes, he somehow had a different mind tucked away in my brain, but we still shared the same vocal cords. As more chilled ale spilled down my throat, I couldn't tell if the satisfied moan that vibrated my tongue was mine or his. Whatever the case, it couldn't be denied that we were both in need of a drink under the circumstances. Malthus, I said. That's your name, right? My reflection nodded, a half-smile lifting the right side of my mouth. And you don't remember any more than that? I mean, I do, just not much, you know? I remember the light, not much different from what you saw when you let me in. I had found someone, I think someone I'd lost, but then, I don't know, it's like... For a second, I was just nothing, which is impossible, right? How so? Once you're something, you can't be nothing. Nothing doesn't exist, you see. If you exist, you can't not. Still, I can't explain it. I don't know how much time passed before I found myself caught in the wind, for lack of a better term. Huh? I didn't have a body, didn't have any kind of physical form at all, but I was still something. It was like I was caught in a tornado, soaring from one direction to the next with no control. After a time, after God knows how long, I managed to get a grip on it. I couldn't control it, to a point. For what felt like years and milliseconds, at the same time, I just rode that wind, watching the world go by. Don't know how I found myself at your house, but it felt like I was almost drawn to it, you know? I saw what happened, saw what they did to you. Something resembling pain struck my chest with those words. I even winced against the sensation, something I hadn't felt inspired to do since I awoke on that hospital bed. Not in this way, anyway. Though I couldn't register physical pain anymore, I felt that agonizing spike carve through my fractured heart. I tried to help. I suppose it was some kind of instinct or something. But there was nothing I could do, whatever it was. My attempt to step in, or just the nature of what I am now. When you got shot... When I tried to stop that bullet from reaching your kid, just like you did, I got trapped. Trapped? That's the best way I can describe it. I got stuck to you, like that bullet pushed me into your head, leaving me no way back out. When you were in that coma, with one foot in this world and one in the other, I was there with you. 
I don't know how, but I knew I could help you find your way back. When you did, I was still left hovering between the two. We just stared at one another. My reflection and me. I couldn't tell what he was thinking, regardless of the fact that we were roommates in my broken husk. But there was a sadness in his eyes. Well, his eye. I was with you through everything. Your recovery, your pain, and tears. I felt them too. The longer I rode with you, the more I managed to sneak out. It wasn't much, but it was enough to let you know that I was in here. Though I don't entirely know what I am or what I was, I remembered bits and pieces. I remember that there was a way for us to help each other. That I had to invite you. Exactly. I had no words to offer. While I had trouble wrapping my mind around the implications, I couldn't help but wonder if I was simply losing it. With everything I'd endured, it wouldn't exactly be a stretch of the imagination. Perhaps this was some sort of multiple personality disorder brought on by the mental and physical trauma that made far more sense than some entity hitchhiking in my brain. It was as these thoughts crossed the surface of my mind that my mental roommate spoke again. I know what you're thinking. This can't be real, right? I just looked back at him, my wandering thoughts crash landing back to ground level. There's other stuff I remember how to do, too. With that, he laid the almost empty beer bottle on the coffee table, raised my bloody and swollen hand in front of my eyes, and left my jaw hanging limp again. As the split flesh began to seal itself back shut, the yellowing, purple, swollen tissue shrinking back to both its normal shade and size. I whipped my other hand up next to the one I couldn't break my gaze from, seeing that it too had resumed its regularly scheduled programming. I pulled the blood-soaked socks from my feet to see only the stains left by the crimson fluid, but not a hint of damage in sight. It'd take a bit more work, given they've already healed as much as they can, but I think I can fix these too. He said, rubbing a hand across the bumpy texture of the scarring on my face. No. I said, still mesmerized by the display of my apparently not being nuts. Not until they pay for what they did. You sure? There, a reminder. A reminder of what they took from me. Fair enough. We talked back and forth for some hours that day. While we got no closer to any answers as to what he was before all of this, and how to track down the men who tore my life apart, we were both on the same page. The more we conversed, the more I not only grew fond of my new mental companion, but even found myself laughing for the first time in what felt like years by this point. Likely, the more beers we tossed back had a hand in that, but it was a sensation I hadn't realized I missed so much. While any break in the conversation would find my mind wandering back to my brooding state, Malthus had an uncanny ability to pull me back in. I had my suspicions about what he was before he found himself without a physical form, as did he, I suspect, but I wasn't afraid of him. Regardless of what I believed him to be in life, I wanted to help him as much as he hoped to assist me. I swore to myself that when my vengeance was behind me, I would do what I could to remake him before I took the final step to end my own suffering. I didn't inform him about my intention to rejoin my wife and daughter after the credits rolled on my quest to avenge their murders, but it wouldn't make a difference if I did. I had a feeling he'd try to talk me down from the ledge, which would just drag this out longer than necessary. No, my mind was made up. Once this was done, and after I had found a way to restore my new friend, I would have no reason to continue on in this world. Call me overly dramatic or a self-pitying fool if you must, but I had no attachment to this world anymore. Only my vengeance, and nothing more. Weeks would pass as we looked deeper into the death of Eliza Prague, as well as her husband's dealings with the elusive Mr. Thorne. We couldn't find much at first, but Malthus had some more hidden talents than neither of us realized until they presented themselves. Once we tracked down Samuel Jessup, the detective in charge of the Prague case, my roommate managed to convince him to be a little more forthcoming about the investigation than he had previously been inspired to be. While they didn't have much to go on, aside from what they seemed unable to prove, that Mr. Thawne had arranged for this man to be silenced, the detective did have some relevant information for us. Ezekiel Thawne had apparently been quite cooperative with the authorities, allowing them to search his various homes and inspect the contents of his computers to prove his innocence in this crime. Yes, nobody believed the man for a second, but he was apparently quite experienced in covering his tracks. Though this ended up being quite useless to the feds, it may prove quite the opposite for us. 
It can be taken for granted that he had far more properties than what he had led them to believe, but we had a variety of addresses to go on now. It's very possible that Thawne would be hiding out in some other part of the world to avoid any potential follow-ups, but Malthus and I were both of the opinions that would not be the case. Regardless of what the authorities suspected, that this was the man responsible for silencing Preg, as well as what he was covering up in the first place, he was playing the part of an innocent bystander right now. Someone with no reason to hide would look far more suspicious if he disappeared off the face of the earth while under investigation. With every day we spent looking into the various properties, Malthus grew stronger and more aware of his abilities. Given my lack of pain receptors, we did some test runs to see how quickly he could heal any potential injuries. We started simply, a slice here, a poke there, enough to break the skin deeply enough to warrant healing. That first day, after several hours of carving deeper and deeper wounds, I could tell he was wearing down. He sealed every one of them shut within seconds, but I could tell him tiring the longer it went on. A couple of days later, once he assured me he was in fit shape again, we took it to the next level. Even without the ability to feel it, it was no small task to lop off my left pinky. I splayed it out on the cutting board with the butcher's knife held high and ready to strike, but I froze up. Perhaps it was just the nature of self-mutilation, more so than the physical strain of it. After Malthus offered to take the wheel, I almost took him up on it, but I knew he would need his full focus to repair it if that would be a possibility. Biting down and almost tempted to close my eyes, I swiped the blade down as hard as I could, severing the finger, just below the central knuckle. It's a strange sensation, glaring down at a separated body part. I almost began to hyperventilate, a scream froze in my throat, but when the tissue steadily began to regrow, I almost started cackling like a madman. My roommate and I both burst out into a fit of insane laughter as the pinky regenerated with its predecessor still oozing on the counter. We grew even more hysterical when I wrapped the discarded digit in a paper towel and tossed it in the trash like some spoiling leftovers. How far you want to take this? Malthus asked after we calmed down from our fit. I guess as far as what we might be facing. I said with a chuckle, still mesmerized by my less tanned finger. They'll kill us when they figure out what we're there for, or try to, anyway. His voice grew more serious than it had since we met, so to speak. He was right, of course. Depending on whatever sort of security Thawne had, there could potentially be bullets flying left and right. I wasn't exactly trained in the art of stealth or anything of that nature, so we would have to be prepared to face whatever was waiting head on. We were going to have to push our little experiment as far as we could if we would have a chance of reaching our end goal. While we continued our research into where to locate Thon, we gathered up some supplies for testing the capabilities of my roommate. Guns, knives, a propane torch, a drill with various sized bits, and even a chainsaw were sitting on my dining table by the end of that week. That Saturday, we took the next step, removing my left hand at the wrist with the chainsaw. Though I felt little more than a violent vibration as we chewed through the tissue and bone, I almost passed out a few times just watching it. I yielded control of the arm that guided the tool to Malthus, when I became incapable of controlling the shivering in my limb and lurching of my stomach. When the hand fell to the plastic we had lined the floor with, gushing just as much blood as the stump left in its wake, I dropped to my knees, spilling the contents of my gut beside it. We had determined, throughout many discussions, that the left arm would be the best place to start. Being right-handed, we had a better chance of seeing our plan through to the end if this didn't work. Of course, if my new friend's healing abilities had not grown strong enough to replace the missing parts, it was unlikely we would survive, but it still made the most sense. I could risk neither my prominent hand nor the ability to run if it came to it. As I gazed, slack-jawed and unblinking at my oozing wrist, I could feel my passenger straining to stop the blood flow. When the spilling crimson dissipated and being replaced by something slowly growing from the grizzled wound, we both let out another burst of triumphant and mad laughter. Within seconds, a pale and pulsing hand had fully formed in place of the one we had removed. I could barely believe it. Yes, I had very much hoped that this experiment would end up as successful as the pinky finger, but I was bewildered nonetheless. Not only could I flex and move the fingers just as well as the one I had since birth, but the whole hand regrew quicker than the pinky had. You're getting stronger. I said, still gazing at my new hand. Hell yes. Malthus said, his words passing through my lips just as my own had. You got more in you, or should we wait? We can do some more, just not too much. I'm getting there though. 
For the next few hours, we drilled holes in my legs, chest, and left arm, all of which sealed up quicker than the last. I dug the knife into my gut, leaving it in place while we scorched my flesh in various places with the torch. Though the healing process maintained its rapid success, I could feel Malphus straining more as time progressed. We took the rest of that day, as well as the one that followed for him to recuperate, focusing on our research. When Monday came, we headed out to pick up a new vehicle. I paid cash for a used truck, one that would be fit for off-road travel. I was a little nervous getting back behind the wheel after so long, but the muscle memory kicked back in before I knew it. We swung back by the apartment, loaded up some bags, and headed to the outskirts of the city for our next test. It seemed the best idea to get as far away from people as we could for this part. Not only would it be a bad idea to fire a gun in my loft as the sound would quickly alert the authorities, but I didn't want to risk inadvertently firing into another apartment. Once we were far enough away, both from prying eyes and any potentially innocent victims, I found a good place to park before walking deep into the woods off the side of the road. As I stood there in the open clearing, somewhere in the middle of nowhere, I suddenly realized that I wasn't certain where to aim the first shot. Go big or go home. Malthus said with a chuckle. If this works, I said, attempting to control my nerves as I lifted the barrel to my temple. Would it regrow the parts that mute the pain? I don't know, man. This is new territory for us both, I think. I guess we'll find out. Here goes nothing. I don't know if it was me or my roommate who pulled the trigger, but everything went blank after I heard the hammer release. I have no way of knowing how much time passed before the lights flicked back on, but when I rose from the dirt, gasping for breath, my initial fear was not what I expected. Malthus? I said, feeling a strange sort of absence in my mind. Are you still there? My heart felt as though it wanted to push through my sternum over what was likely seconds at most. Whoa, the voice said from within my newly repaired skull, allowing my breathing to finally regulate once more. Now that was something different. With a heavy and grateful sigh, I climbed back to my trembling legs, uncertain if we should push any further. I unconsciously dug the fingernail of my right forefinger into the flesh of my thumb, exhaling again when I registered nothing more than light pressure. Keep going. My friend said, his thoughts sounding exhausted, but energized at the same time. Empty the clip. Without giving myself a second guess or verifying that he was certain, I picked the gun back up, held it outstretched before me with my thumb on the trigger, and fired every bullet it had left into my torso. Even without my pain receptors, it was a strange sensation, feeling the bullets that had not passed through me push themselves into the surface as the tissue reformed. It actually tickled a bit, causing us both to laugh again at the madness of it all. After another hour or so, and three more magazines having been emptied into my flesh in various places, my friend and I both felt satisfied that we had done enough testing. Between 40 or so bullets, the cordless drill, some serious burns, and amputation, all of which had been successfully healed without so much as light scarring, I felt confident that we could survive whatever thawed through at us. It wasn't until we made our way back into the city that one last idea came to me when I looked upon the outline of the skyscrapers ahead. What do you think? I asked, assuming my roommate could see what had caught our eye. Go big, he said, or go home, I replied. Of course, this was not something we could do until the city was asleep. We could neither risk falling on anyone, inadvertently sending them to an early grave, nor having any witnesses. I considered turning the truck around and seeking out a mountain, rather than a building in the dead center of a crowded city, but neither of us wanted to have a climb back up the damn thing to reach the truck. We headed back to the loft, picking up a case of beer on the way. I had no intention of potentially doling the senses or abilities of my friend, but if this one final test should be a success, I thought a celebration would be in order. Once I got back to my home, I thought it best to rest a bit before the hour was late enough for our last experiment. I didn't know about Malthus, but I was positively exhausted. I set an alarm for three in the morning, hoping that we would track down a good spot for a leap of faith before the world would awaken again. It didn't take me long to pass out, but I could feel the restlessness of my roommate as I drifted off. I could tell that he was nervous about this one. I was too. But I knew it had to be done if we were to have a hope of making it through this. When I awoke to find myself in a foreign location, I almost feared I had been abducted in the night, perhaps by the very man we sought out. 
It wasn't until I felt the cool wind caressing my otherwise somewhat numb face that I understood what was going on. I couldn't sleep. Malthus said in a monotone voice. Figured I'd do the legwork while you were out. How high up are we? I asked, choosing this question over the actual location of the building we stood upon. Twenty-three floors, give or take. That should do it. I walked towards the edge of the roof, my stomach climbing into my throat as I gazed over the side. While I could hear the occasional car drifting by from the other side of the building, the back alley I looked down on appeared deserted enough to leave no breadcrumbs behind. Should we walk away from this? Are you sure about this? Malphus asked. Not remotely. Yeah. I just gazed out at the world, breathing in the air like it was the last taste of oxygen that would ever reach my lungs. Regardless of all of our prior experiments, I was suddenly gripped by the idea that this would not go as smoothly as those attempts. Still, I wouldn't allow myself to back down from this. If the men who killed my wife and daughter were only a fraction of what we may face, I had a feeling that if we couldn't see the other side of this, we would be dead before we had a hope of seeing things through to the end. Dead here or dead there made no difference if we couldn't pull this off. You ready? I asked. Run and jump or floppy fish? He asked with a chuckle. I could use a run. I said, joining his laughter and backing away from the ledge. About fifteen paces back, I stopped in place, my heart once more threatening to shoot from my chest like a cannonball. I closed my eyes, hearing the wind breathe around me, commanding my lungs to follow suit. When I blinked them back open, I allowed an arrogant smirk to reach across my lips, cackling like a crazy man as I pushed one foot in front of the other. My friend and I screamed out in unison as we quickly closed the gap, leaping across the border of the roof. As my body struck the wall of the opposing building, I felt my shoulder dislocate and my collarbone shatter. I pushed back with my legs, only sending myself back to the building I leaped from, my shoulder blades cracking against the bricks. From there, I crashed into a fire escape ladder, pinballing, the pinballing this way and that, more of my bones shattering with every hit. I felt the skin tear from my face and peel from my arms and legs. The sound of ripping cloth and snapping twigs echoed as I found more obstacles to slam into over my swift descent. The final sound of something akin to a water balloon filled with meat and bone exploding against brick and mortar was all I heard before I fell into the black. Somewhere in the darkness, I felt myself still fallen, though I wasn't crashing against any obstacles this time, only drifting downwards through a seemingly endless expanse. I could neither slow nor cease my descent. Don't let go, bud. The familiar voice called out from far away. I... I can't stop. You can, though. Ain't no rules here. Well, not the same as where you are, anyway. Though I had no form that I was aware of, I still felt hopelessness awaken from within whatever I was at the time. I cried out, the rage of having apparently failed in this most recent experiment threatening to break whatever was left of my will. Can't end this way. I whimpered. It won't. The voice spoke. But I can't help you on this one. You gotta want it, kid. I still couldn't stop, my desperation to hold on slipping. I almost wanted to resign myself to whatever was to come next, whatever lay beyond the world I left behind. As I allowed the despair to reach its tendrils deep into my soul, my conviction for my vengeance wavering, it was not the voice of my new friend that inspired me to hold on just a little while longer, but one I was certain I would never hear again. Daddy. That single word immediately prevented me from falling any further, freezing my wayward soul in place. Lynn? I called out. Lindsay, baby girl, is that? I didn't have a chance to finish my question before the lights flickered on again, yet another unfamiliar location greeting my eyes, which again struggled to focus. I shook my hand in an attempt to fend off the almost paralyzing dizziness, blinking rapidly to clear my blurry vision. That was quite an impressive display, Mr. Baker. A disembodied voice said, What? Where the... I wonder if you would be so kind as to share with me how you achieved such a feat. The haze before me finally clearing up, I was finally able to make out my newfound surroundings. I was neither in the alley I dropped to from the rooftop nor my loft, but strapped to an inclined slender cot in a dimly lit room. The stainless steel table to my left held an array of quite intimidating-looking 
bladed tools, while the two armed guards, dressed similarly to those who took my family and me captive, just glared at me from the front of the room. When some bright fluorescent bulbs flickered on above me, allowing me to take in the rest of the large circular room, several more armed men followed a short and disturbingly smooth-skinned slender man in a white coat through the lone door. The man in the lab coat looked like the quintessential mad scientist with the light reflecting off his bald head and rimless glasses, an unsettling grin reaching across his thin lips. Dr. Lynch will be performing an examination on you if you don't mind. The voice that I could now see was coming from the speakers next to a large screen mounted above the door before me. But should you have an interest in sharing how you managed to survive such a fall, we can forgo his procedure. That you, Thon? I asked, having little doubt that the thin man the monitor showed me was the one I was seeking. Though he was sitting in a high-backed and honestly quite uncomfortable yet fancy-looking chair, I could tell that he was both tall and slender. The dark shirt, vest, and tie he wore only accentuated how pale he was. He looked surprisingly young, maybe in his early forties if I were to guess. Given what I had heard about the man, I had assumed him to be more of the elderly crime boss rather than some skinny, arrogant-looking middle-aged prick. His face was long and gaunt, a neatly trimmed black mustache almost drawn across his upper lip. His equally dark hair was perfectly parted on the left, looking as though so much product was applied to it that his scalp could very well be bulletproof. The bright emerald green of his eyes, though, there was something strangely unsettling about them, but I couldn't quite put my finger on what. It is indeed, my boy. He said, his every word lined with condescension. I have been keeping an eye on you since you awoke in that hospital. I had a feeling you may be inspired to plot some manner of vengeance for my mongrel's mistakes. I had no idea that you possessed such interesting talents, though. It is safe to say that, in recent weeks, I have been anticipating our meeting just as much as you have. How about you come on down and meet me face to face, then? I said with far more arrogance than I had a right to, especially given my current circumstances. Another time, perhaps, he replied, but rest assured that I can see everything. Taking note of the cameras posted around the circumference of the room, I let out a sigh with the knowledge that he was likely many miles away, watching on safely from a distance. He was very likely staring at a similar screen to the one I gazed upon at the time, somewhere well out of reach and I managed to break loose. I have, however, sent along a few old friends to watch over you in my stead. It wasn't until then that I recognized the familiar hunger behind the eyes of one of the large men who still stood behind the door, along with that sinister grin lifting the thick fabric of his woolen mask. Well, hello there, Rick, I said, attempting to contain my burgeoning rage, my face tingling as the skin flushed. He granted me no reply just a nod of recognition. I couldn't tell if any of the other goons in the room who were amongst those who ripped my life in two, but one way or another, I vowed I would see this man dead before the mad scientist could cut me into ribbons. You still there, Malthus? I asked within the confines of my mind, suddenly unsettled that he hadn't spoken up since I reawoke. I'm here, bud. What's the plan? Though I hadn't the remotest idea of how to get out of my current predicament, I knew that I could not grant Thawne the answers he sought, not if I still hoped to reach him before the dust settled. Whatever they do to us, don't heal. Not yet, anyway. I ain't gonna let you die. We're not dying here, but I can't let him see you at work. I'll keep you ticking, but I'll try not to make it obvious. Cool? Cool. This isn't going to go how you think, Thawne. I said, glaring contemptuously at the man on the screen. I'm not some sort of miracle cure. Dear boy, I watched your body repair itself after you practically blew apart upon hitting the pavement. Do not think of me as a fool. No mortal man could have survived that, not without a mark on them. It wasn't until then that I thought to take a look at myself. As he said, I didn't have a scratch on me. My shirt and shoes have been removed, but my tattered jeans still wore the crimson stains left in the wake of my fall. Some of the scarring left over the night that left me a widower had even cleared up, presumably from the tissue being torn and regrown. Dr. Lynch, Bond said, You may begin. Start slowly, of course, but feel no need to restrain yourself from there. 
The still grinning lips of the mad scientist peeled further back, revealing gleamingly white, likely false teeth. My old buddy, Rick, moved in closer, wearing his rabid smile as the old man reached for the table, retrieving a simple scalpel. His first swipe moved so quickly, I barely registered it at first. It wasn't until I felt my still burning face scream with a sudden spike of agony that I realized this was going to be a far more brutal experience than my experiments of the last few days. Shit, I said internally, trying to distract my senses as my left cheek was split in the same way as my right. I felt it too, Malphus replied. I think we might have damaged more than we intended with that fall. Can you block the pain? I don't know, bud. I gotta use everything I got to keep us in one piece, especially if I can't seal us up just yet. As another swipe sliced through my chest, followed by two more in quick succession, I just bit down, hoping that I could handle how far this may go. You can do this, Terry, my roommate said, his words lined with compassion. You know I can fix it, you just gotta give me the word. Stick to the plan, these bastards can't hurt me any worse than they already have. When the man in the lab coat cursed in frustration, likely from the wounds not closing up as expected, he raised the scalpel high, slamming it down into my chest over and over again. I couldn't prevent an agonized wail from reaching my lips when he buried his blade deep into my flesh, twisting it from one side to the other. Whether it was because I had felt so little physical sensation for so long, or that the pain was truly this intense, I couldn't say. Whatever the case, I fought to distance my mind from my body as much as I could, bracing myself with every cut and tear. He's not healing! The duck cried out, carving his knife through my midsection. What are you playing at, Mr. Baker? Thon asked, his expression lined with as much frustration as his lab dog. I'm not playing, I said, wincing with every word. I'm not what you think. I am not a gullible idiot, boy. I watch you fall. I watch your body repair. Do not play games. I was trying to kill myself, you ignorant prick. I don't know what the hell happened after that. We just glared at one another, his unblinking eyes fixed on my watering ones, still reeling from the numerous wounds carved into me. It felt like a ridiculous staring contest between teenagers rather than a hostage facing his captor, but I wouldn't back down. Take it to the next level, Dr. Lynch. Vaughn said, his lip twitching as he stared down his nose at me. Even when the snarling goon in the white coat slammed a thick and jagged blade on my forearm, pulling it back and forth as he sawed into my limb, I refused to break my gaze from the man on the screen. The stocky man in the woolen mask continued to drool from my periphery, seemingly getting off on this brutal display, but I still would not look away. I would not allow myself to wince even when the blade began to rip through my other arm its previous victim dangling from the strap it was affixed to. By the time the only strap holding me in place was the one across my chest, my amputated limbs hanging in varying angles, my head was quite loopy, but my gaze was still transfixed. Thawne gave a heavy sigh, finally turning away from me and shaking his head in disgust. You're losing too much blood, Malphis said, his voice strained from keeping us alive. I can't keep us going much longer if you don't put us back together. Just a little while longer. I replied, my conviction waning. I knew that if we gave Thon what he wanted, I would be likely to spend months strapped to that damned cot, being dissected over and over again until he got his answers. Not only that, but my chances of achieving my goal while he sought out his would have little chance of coming to fruition. Shall I continue? The bald man asked, heaving with labored breath. Thon seemed to consider his words for a moment, stealing glances at me in between turning away. It would seem he didn't quite have the stomach for his own experiment. No. He said with another defeated exhale. Finish him off and dispose of As Rig drew and raised his rifle, a satisfied smile replacing the hungered one, his employer practically screamed out, Wait! The grin fell from the face of the one who ripped my life in two, his gun arm dropping lifelessly to his side. Thawne lifted himself from his chair and vanished from the screen, so quickly that I barely saw him move. The minutes trickled by as every breath felt more and more difficult to achieve. I could tell that Malphus was struggling as much as I was at the time, but I had no idea what my captor was planning next. As the armed men in the room gathered up and began indulging in some side conversation, the doctor, distracted by cleaning up his tools, 
I knew we would have to make our move soon. When Thawne appeared back on the screen, pulling someone else into view with him, my struggling heart began to beat so rapidly it may well have forced every ounce of blood I had left out of my many gaping wounds. Daddy! My beautiful baby girl called out, tears spilling down her face. What did you do to him? Do you feel a little more inspired to reveal your secrets now? Thawne said, gripping the shoulder of my daughter so tightly that she screamed even harder. The second I saw her face, my roommate needed no word to hasten his work. The primal scream that left my mouth echoed through the circular room, instantly catching the attention of every other inhabitant. Something triggered within me that I had never felt before, as though the essence of Malthus and I truly became one for the first time. Thawne shrieked a victorious wail as each of my limbs reformed within seconds before pushing me free from the cot, bursting through the strap across my chest like tissue paper. The sounds of multiple guns discharging joined my battle cry as I leaped upon the one who started all of this. Look away, baby girl, I said, glancing up to meet her glassy eyes. Daddy's coming to get you. When she turned away, I pushed the beefy assassin hard against the wall, his head connecting with a loud thud knocking him out cold in the process. This was good. He would not die just yet, nor with the man in the lab coat crawling across the floor to get to the exit. I rammed my foot into his gut, launching him next to his fallen comrade. As bullets tore through my flesh, the hole sealing themselves shut, spitting the fragmented shells onto the floor, I moved from one of my attackers to the next. I made quick work of them, punching my fists through their tactical vests and into the candy center, blending their gushing blood with my own. I tore out throats, peeled away limbs like the wings of a fly and shattered bones beneath my heels. Two of them ran for the door, but they would not reach their mark. As one of them fumbled to press his finger to the pad on the locking mechanism, I sped toward him, swiftly pushing his head against the heavy steel door, flattening it like a cockroach. His associate provided the scream. The one who fell limp to the floor was unable to utter until I silenced him in the same manner with the only sounds remaining in the wake of my assault being the blood dripping to the crimson pool at my feet. I took one final glance at the screen. Dawn stared back, slack-jawed at me, my dear Lynn still covering her face with her back to me. Though I could tell that Malthus was exhausted, assuring me that we could likely not take much more punishment without taking some time to recover, I gave my abductor a wink and a smirk. He pulled what appeared to be some sort of radio from a table I couldn't see, ordering more troops to head to my location. But I couldn't run just yet. Not without convincing the two, I left breathing to grant me some answers. Before the screen faded to black, I offered him one last thing to look forward to. See you soon, bud. Whether that sentiment came from me or Malthus, I can't say. But we were on the same page. Whatever the case, I had no time to waste. I had to assume that Thawne would not remain where he was for much longer. He was likely already enacting his plan to escape, so I had to get my answers quickly. Wake up, I said, peeling the woolen mask from the face of my wife's killer. His thick and shaggy blonde hair fell across the thick eyebrows above his tightly closed eyelids. The wide nose that looked to have suffered more than a few breaks over the years twitched ever so slightly, as did his wide mouth that was still lined with saliva. Quit baking it. I whispered directly into one of his cauliflower ears. If you don't open those eyes, I'll start peeling parts off of you until you do. He didn't seem to require any further convincing, quickly revealing those bloodshot eyes the second the words left my mouth. It was a job, man. He bargained, his body mimicking the spasm of his nose and mouth. Wasn't nothing personal. It took every ounce of self-control I had left not to push my blood-soaked thumbs into his skull. Barely maintaining my composure, I lifted him from the floor, slamming his back down onto the cot from which my discarded limbs still dangled. He continued to beg and bargain, something that was quite reminiscent of our first meeting, though our circumstances had reversed. Just tell me where Thawne is, and I'll let you go. I, I, can't, I can't, he'll kill me. Those words being enough to assure me that he did indeed know where his employer was located. I would have no more use for the man in the lab coat who was moaning back to awareness. And what do you think I will do? I said calmly, swiftly forcing my heel against the face of the doctor who butchered me, bursting his skull across the wall. Jesus! 
The room's only other living occupant shrieked, seemingly having lost his taste for the sight of blood. Where is he? Here, he's in the building. Don't lie to me, I said, battling to keep my cool. I, I, I'm not. I, I, it's the truth. Even he isn't arrogant enough to be in the same place he's torturing someone. I'm not some gullible victim. Not anymore. Tell me the... It's the truth, I swear to Christ it is. He's cocky as hell, Thawne th th thinks he's immortal. He always... Where in the building? The, the top floor, the, the penthouse. I turned back to the door, fully understanding that I had no time to waste. Though I wanted to make him suffer for what he did to me, he didn't deserve a quick death. All that mattered was getting to Lindsay. I would reach her, and Thawne, then my vengeance be damned. As I pulled the limp arm of the man who previously attempted to unlock the door to this chamber of horrors, pressing his thumb to the pad as he had intended, I gave one final glance to the quivering shell of a man on the cot. If I ever see you again, I said through gritted teeth as the door drifted open, I will introduce you to a pain you can barely fathom. As I left him behind, sobbing like a frightened child in a pool of my own blood, I began to run down the long hallway ahead of me. The sound of a good many footfalls approaching from where I was headed assured me that reaching my target would be no simple task. But I wouldn't stop. I couldn't stop. I was fighting for something far more important than my vengeance now. You still good? I asked my traveling companion. A bit winded, but I got this. Ain't backing down now. Let's finish this. To the end then. As countless silhouettes reflected on the wall of the curve ahead, I turned my run into a full-on sprint, baring my teeth like a feral jackal. Within seconds, gunfire echoed once more, bullets ripping through my flesh, but I would not allow myself to acknowledge the pain. I would not allow it to slow me down. Though the hallway was wide enough for four large people to comfortably walk side by side, there was no order to the mob ahead. They practically fell over one another as they fought to reach me, that was, of course, until the blood began to flow. I quickly tore through the first wave, hunching over to thrust the claws that sprouted from my fingertips into their flesh, their Kevlar providing little protection against my wrath. The more bits and pieces of their associates that spilled to the concrete floor and slapped to the walls, the more the crowd began to thin. Not only was I swiftly lessening their numbers, but as they witnessed my wound ceiling shut before their eyes, they knew I could not be stopped. Those who ran for me only succeeded in showing me the path to follow, but they were not my target. They could all escape with their lives for all I cared. As they led me to both an elevator and a staircase, some falling over in their attempts to seal themselves behind the sliding door of the lift and others tripping up the steps, I leaped over those who cowered on the concrete. I continued to chase after those bounding up the steps, finally reaching the ground floor of what appeared to be some sort of mansion. While most headed for the open door to the outside world, I tackled the whimpering man closest to me, pushing him to the wall and rearing back with my claws. Thon, where is he? he? He's gone, man. Where? I screamed, thrusting my hand through the wall next to his head. A helicopter, out back. I shrieked a sound I didn't know myself to be capable of, an anguished squeal lined with fury and pain. Did he... Take her. Her? The girl. I screamed, tearing into the wall on the other side of him. Did he take her with him? Uh, no, uh, uh, up, upstairs, fourth floor. With that, I allowed him to fall to the floor, sprinting to the staircase at the rear of the room. It took little time to reach the top floor, passing by nothing more than the occasional cowering guards, begging to be spared. When I pushed through the heavy double doors that led into the penthouse, what instantly caught my eyes caused my thumping heart to shatter again. Oh, God, no. I whimpered, falling to my knees next to my precious little girl. The ornate knife protruded from her chest. The pool of blood around her grew larger by the second. Her normally rosy cheeks looked so pale and lifeless. I had taken too long to reach her. Malthus, what do I do? How can I fix this? Only silence greeted me for what felt like an eternity until a familiar sentence caused my heart to skip several beats. Let me in. 
With those three words, I understood exactly what he meant. I leaned in, pulling the blade from my daughter's chest and lifted her from the floor, pulling her close. I had no idea how this would work, but I felt safe in the knowledge that my friend would. It's hard to describe the sensation of him leaving me. It felt as though my skeleton was painlessly peeling through the flesh and muscle tissue. It was like a significant part of my being was separating, leaving a strange sort of hollow in its stead. Once my equilibrium regulated, I leaned in, praying to everything holy that she could still hear me. You have to give him permission. I softly whispered into her ear. You have to invite him. It'll be okay, baby girl. Daddy's got you now. I was trembling all over as I gazed upon the lifeless husk of my little girl. This had to work. I couldn't lose her again. Was this whole ordeal just some sort of cruel joke where whatever forces that lay beyond human reach toying with me? Please, please come back to me. I begged my tears blending with the crimson stains across my chest. I felt deflated as the fragment of hope I held onto spilled to the floor in streams of salt water and blood. As I felt my fractured heart split in two, a slight twitch against my arm almost inspired it to leap into my throat. Lindsay began to shiver so violently, I feared that her little bones would shatter. Though her eyes were still shut, a subtle light began to glow from behind them. A scream echoed from her mouth, growing louder and louder before steadily simmering down forming a single word. Did, did, daddy? As one of Lindsay's beautiful big hazel eyes blinked back open, along with a subtly glowing orange one, a trembling smile reached across her lips. I glanced at her chest, seeing no trace of the gaping wound left in the wake of the dagger I pulled free from it. I pulled her close, holding her tightly as her weakened arms reached around my back. This brief moment of jubilation at the rebirth of my beloved daughter came to a quick and sudden conclusion when a familiar voice spoke from behind me. So that's your secret then. I spun to face the man who had ordered the execution of my family, pushing myself in front of Lindsay. Just let us go, Thon. Dear boy, he said, nodding to two men I hadn't noticed. I will do no such thing. One of the bulky men trained his rifle on me. While the other, my old friend I had left bleeding in the basement, only grinned as he glanced down at what he held. I know very little about firearms. I couldn't tell you the first thing about any of the weapons that had been fired on me that day, aside from the fact that bullets fucking hurt. That being said, it didn't take much knowledge of various types of weaponry to recognize a flamethrower. Run, baby girl. I whispered. Run, and don't look back. But, Daddy, I... I won't lose you again. Just go. Malthus will keep you safe. With tears still streaming down her face, she ran to the back of the room, through a door, and out of my sight. You won't escape, Thon said, the arrogance having returned to his voice. You do understand that, right? Whatever happens from here. I said, the trembling in my own voice giving way to a cockiness I was certain I could not back up. I won't let you get to her. Dear boy, he said, giving a nod to the man with the flamethrower. You have no concept of your limitations. I still glared at him through the flames as they began to consume me. The pain was immediate and more intolerable than anything I had experienced thus far, anything physical, that is. What Thon failed to understand, as I charged towards him, my rage pushing the bubbling and splitting of my flesh aside, was that he could not bring me any more suffering than he already had. Of course, what I failed to realize, as my target quickly pulled the guard from his left before him, was that I would be unable to tell who was who by the time my eyeballs burst from the intense heat. Regardless of that fact, whoever it was I wrapped my arms around, my strength dwindling as my muscle tissue peeled and separated from the bone, screamed louder than I did as they too became consumed by the flames. We both fell to the floor my senses registering nothing else as my consciousness once more drifted into the black. As I made my descent for the third time, certain that this would be my last, I felt content in the knowledge that my beautiful little girl would be alright. My ex-roommate would make quick work of those who remained in the world I left behind. She would see tomorrow, and many more days to come. It was that very thought that allowed me to let loose my grip on the life I once had. 
allowing the darkness to finally claim the prize that had slipped its grasp one too many times. I did enough. I could let go. I was at peace. Finally. At peace. You're not serious. A voice sarcastically spoke from the black. What? You're just gonna ditch out on your kid without a fight? Without a f- Are you serious? We've come too far for you to just throw in the towel now, bud. You have got to be joking. I'm dead. Burned to a damn crisp. What else can I do? You can quit this little pity party and use some common sense for one. What exactly is that supposed to mean? Who do you think you're talking to right now? Huh? Who? Um, wait. Quite the little spitfire, your little girl. Chip off the old block, I dare say. She did it. Don't worry, bud. I didn't let her go too far. Didn't want her any more traumatized than she already is. I hadn't even realized I stopped falling, nor had I noticed the light drawing closer by the second. Got a little present waiting for you when you wake up. Oh yeah, one more thing. Gonna need that invitation again. Gotta make it official and all. Malthus. I said, my being soaring swiftly toward the light. I invite you in. Again. As blurry shapes began to reform my new eyes, I could feel my body still repairing itself. I glanced to my side to see Lindsay standing there, with blood spattered across her dress and her hands held over her face. Is she okay? I asked, my rapid heartbeat dusting off the cinders. Ain't her blood, Malthus said with a chuckle. Why is she covering her face? I asked as my body spasmed, life returning to my limbs while the new skin grew. Your clothes burned off before your skin did, bud. Didn't want her to see you like that. Seeing you all crispy was bad enough. Nobody should see their parents in their birthday suits. When I regained the ability to sit up straight, my roommate pointed out the clothes he'd laid out for me. Took the liberty of grabbing some things from the closet. Might be a tight fit, but better than nothing. As I got to my feet, pulling up the neatly pressed dress pants, I took note of the present Malfa spoke of. The sight of both my old buddy, Rick, and Thon tied down to chairs side by side, both of them beaten and bloody, brought me a smile I didn't know I had in me. Oh, I said, trying not to chuckle. You shouldn't have. I didn't get you anything. That ain't entirely true, bud. Malthus said, with something mischievous in his voice. I got a bit of a favor to ask before this next part. At first, I was almost reluctant about what he asked me to do for him. It wasn't a matter of trust, of course. Nothing he had shown me over these months we had spent together had given me any reason not to trust him. I was simply uncertain if what he wanted would go as planned, given what we had learned about Thon. Regardless of that, I agreed to his request. It was bittersweet in more ways than I could even begin to express, but he assured me that this could end up mutually beneficial in the long run. Shall we finish this now? I asked, glaring down at Thon, whose glassy and swollen eyes stared into mine. While I was tempted to peel the duct tape from his mouth to allow him to speak his final words, as I retrieved the ornate knife from the floor, still lined with my daughter's blood, I had heard more than enough of anything he had to say. It's about time I return this to you, I said, allowing the light to reflect against the crimson crusted blade. Daddy? Lindsay said, still holding her hands on her face. Go to the other room, baby girl. I'll be there in just a little while. I gave her a warm smile as she hesitantly pulled her hands away, revealing her own beaming grin behind them. She didn't so much as glance at the two strapped to the chairs, nor any of the other corners the wide room held as she ran to the back door. I just watched her until the door sealed shut, turning my attention back to the whimpering man-child before me. His muffled moans and shaking head seemed to signify he was in a certain degree of denial of his own mortality but I made sure to clear up his illusions to the contrary as I slowly pushed it deep into his chest. I just watched on as he coughed, squeezing blood from behind the tape around his mouth as he twitched and spasmed, his eyelids losing their battle to remain open. I would not look away until his final breath was spent. Rick was wrestling against the tight bindings holding him in place, attempting to scream from his sealed mouth, but I wasn't ready for him, not just yet. You sure about this? I asked my roommate as Thon's body slumped lifelessly in his chair. They said he thought he was immortal. You sure this will end him? He ain't no immortal. Just turn the clock back some is all. Nah, bud. 
He's gone. That's just an empty meat suit now. Well, it's been a trip, my friend. Hey, I ain't bailing on you, just moving out. I'm coming into some money though, it'll be more than enough to share. With that, I once more felt that bizarre sensation of my mind and body being vacated by one of their occupants. As Thawne's hopefully abandoned shell raised, its nose breathing in the fresh oxygen, I felt my back tense up with the fear that he was still lurking in there somewhere. When the head raised to face me, the swollen and split tissue around the twin orange eyes shrinking and sealing back shut, a single wink assured me that it was my friend at the wheel, and not its former owner. I peeled away the duct tape and quickly got to work on cutting the ropes around his midsection, arms, and legs. It smells kind of funny in here, he said in a voice more akin to the one I heard in my mind, rather than the one that ordered me to be butchered. This is going to take some getting used to. We talked back and forth for a moment, both of us ignoring the muffled whimpering of the man still strapped to a chair. Once Malthus began to adjust more to his new living quarters, he threw on some fresh clothes he grabbed from the large closet, while I went into the back room to explain what was going on to my daughter. She was apprehensive at first when the man who wore her abductor's face knelt to look into her eyes, but a smile slowly reached across her lips as they gazed at one another. She reached her arms around his neck, no longer seeing the man who took her mother from her, but the one we both owed her freedom to. After a time, they released their grip on one another, and she turned to face me again, embracing me even more enthusiastically than she had our mutual friend. We both shed tears as we held each other, the day's brutal events fading into as much of a blur as the continued whining of the man I still had business with. Go with Uncle Malphus, I said, finally letting my grip loose on my precious baby girl. I'll be out there in a little bit. Again, she wrapped her arms around his neck as he lifted her from the floor. He offered me a smile and a nod before walking out of the room, whispering to Lindsay to close her eyes until he said it was safe. She buried her little face in the nape of his neck, and I felt my heart swell with the knowledge that this nightmare was almost over. Once I was certain they were out of earshot, I turned my attention back to the man with freshly soiled cargo pants. You could have walked out of here free and clear. You realize that, right? I pulled the tape from his mouth, allowing him the brief opportunity to bargain for his pitiful life. His words were predictable at first, but when I once more picked the blood-soaked knife up from the floor, his pleas turned to threats. He wasn't wrong when he warned me that I was no longer able to patch myself back up if he got loose. Of course, if he hadn't managed to break free of his bindings by this point, he wouldn't have the strength to accomplish much of anything soon. Before I returned to my little girl and the unexpected friend I had made through this grueling journey, I fulfilled the promise I made to the man who murdered my wife, down in that dungeon in which I was cut to pieces. The look in his eyes before the work was done assured me that he had indeed never imagined such pain could exist in this world. After another change of clothes and a quick wipe down of the blood splashed across my face and hands, I left the high-priced secluded mansion behind, taking the passenger seat of the Mercedes my friend had handpicked from the garage. As we drove off, Malphus assured me that he had already arranged for the house to be cleaned having been able to retrieve some lingering memories from his body's previous owner. He reached out to some of the man's contacts who specialized in such things. Not only that, but his search into the back room in the old man's brain allowed him to know where the hell we were located and how to reach my loft some miles away. Lynn was sound asleep by the time we reached the apartment I planned to vacate very soon. It was time to leave this temporary abandonment of my sanity behind and rebuild a future I never could have imagined I would find again. After he dropped me off, Malphus assured me that we would see one another again soon. I bid him farewell, lined with gratitude that inspired my eyes to well up once again. Don't go getting mushy on me, but He said, his own eyes shimmering in the glow of the street lamps. As I carried my daughter through the door of the loft in which I had almost allowed my fractured heart to shatter completely, she began to stir in my arms. When I flicked the light switch to avoid inadvertently stumbling over anything while I made my way across the wide room, her eyes blinked back open. What's that? She asked, an exhausted yawn following her words. I followed her gaze to the chaotically scattered and overlapping words scribbled across my wall. I chuckled at the bizarre display I had only seen through my pain-lined vision, 
honestly perplexed that any version of me had been able to make out a single word. Nothing that matters anymore, baby girl. She was out again before her head met the pillow of my bed, as was I only moments after stretching out on my couch. Not only had the day's events taken a significant toll on me, but the agony that had haunted me since I awoke in that hospital bed, what felt like many years ago, had finally released its hold on me. I would still mourn for my wife as Lynn would for her mother, but that pain was easier to bear with us being together again. More tears would be shed over the months that followed, but pain gave way to acceptance, eventually. Malthus was true to his word, as I had no doubt he would be. We relocated to a new town in a new state, with new identities to boot. Once my friend had milked everything he could from the man whose meat suit he had taken for his own, he found a new host. He assured me that this body was vacated by another awful individual, but one with far fewer authorities sniffing around for any dirt that could incriminate him. He did set up generously funded accounts for both of us before he vacated Thon, allowing his corpse to be found by those who hoped to lock him away and toss the key down a deep well. Though he has ventures of his own, some involving some old friends he left behind before he was left floating in oblivion, Uncle Malthus has been a significant part of Lindsay's life. Even if he's gone for months at times, he sticks around for just as long when he comes around. We have a guest house out back specifically for him. Though I will always miss my beloved Sarah, just as our daughter will, we now look to the future with hope, joy, and love. Something that we would have never found without the writing on the wall.